Hi, my name is Reza Berenci. Uh, today I'm going to review molecular imaging in vascular and traumatic uh, brain injuries. Uh, due to time constraints, I'm only concentrate on mostly PET imaging in TBI and briefly review the brain death. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are over 1.7 million new cases of TBI uh, yearly in the United States in civilians. Um, 1.35 million emergency room visits, uh, 275 hospitalization, and 40% long-term disabilities due to these TBIs. Um, additionally, between 2000 and 2013, around 280,000 service members uh, have been diagnosed with a form of TBI. So the first step in any condition is to raise awareness uh, about it. And for this reason, several attempts have been initiated. One of them is this website called Heads Up, uh, developed by Centers for Disease Control to educate uh, uh, mostly parents and students for high school sports uh, concussions. Same effort by NFL by providing this uh, posters which they posted in the locker rooms to raise awareness about uh, traumatic brain injury among football players. Over the past several years, um, several movies um, have been released and about TBI and PTSD, some of them are listed here. Uh, there are several challenges in evaluating uh, patients with TBI. Um, first of all, there are complex causes of injury. It can be direct trauma to the cortex, uh, acceleration, deceleration, and rotational injuries damage due to hematomas and associated hypoperfusion, and blast exposure damages. Additionally, these patients may have uh, comorbidities with confounding effects. Uh, the evaluation may happen as acute versus chronic effects of the TBI, which are different, and genetic factors have uh, effects on the different individual response to traumatic brain injury. Now we have uh, two main modalities in molecular imaging, PET versus SPEC. This study evaluated the two. Uh, in general, a PET has two to three times higher sensitivity, and what SPEC allows longer acquisition due to longer half-life of radio tracers. Um, the coincidence detection in PET improves image quality, shorter scans, and improved temporal resolution. The spatial resolution is much better um, than uh, SPECT. And the dynamic imaging is uh, possible with uh, PET in better quality, with better quality. Um, our SPECT is widely available technology, is relatively less expensive. Um, timing is more flexible due to higher half-life or longer half-life of radio tracer, um, but it has slower acquisition, lower resolution, and limited availability of uh, radio tracers. This study looked um, from the patients point of view, if there is a preference between PET or SPECT among uh, people with dementia. So they concluded that most participants had no preference for SPECT over PET, but the caregivers had slightly more preference for SPECT uh, because they were allowed to stay with the patient. Overall, PET was not more burdensome compared to SPECT. So comparable, uh, so when you consider an imaging modality, uh, this can be helpful to, to make your decision. Now we're going to review one case of SPECT, and that's the only case I'm reviewing. 
Um, this was a 15 year old uh, girl two months after head injury, um, which demonstrated bilateral um, frontal parietal and caudate and putamen uh, hypoperfusion. Uh, this particular study compared uh, FDG PET uh, to Technetium 99M HMPAO in an acute traumatic brain injury. It was a 28-year-old female after motor vehicle accident. Um, two days after the injury, she had a PET scan, which was normal, but the SPECT study uh, showed significant hypoperfusion uh, to bilateral frontal lobe. So completely different um, image. Now we're gonna focus more on uh, PET and TBI imaging. Uh, patient's preparation can be different based on the radio tracer you use. Uh, but in general, if you're performing FTG PET is very similar. Um, to other type of brain imaging. If you're doing a rest versus task bit study, these are, uh, may have a little bit different uh, preparation for the patient. Image acquisition on all new cameras are 3D, but the older cameras had 2D and 3D um, option. Um, the imaging can be done static versus dynamic, depends on what uh, you're looking for. And in terms of image analysis, it can be qualitative evaluation of the imagers versus quantitative. Um, and in qualitative studies, we can use a ROI-based versus a voxel-based. In ROI-based analyses, uh, we draw an ROI in the region of the brain or the system automatically draws those ROIs and compares it to a normal database um, it's easier to implement and use. It's widely used. Uh, there are several commercial and non-commercial products available, but it has a high inter and intra-observer variability. The voxel-based analysis is harder to implement. Each voxel is an ROI. It re is regard it's regarded as gold standard, um, but it gives you less in variability Um, many different radio tracers have been used in evaluation of TBI in terms of evaluating the metabolism. FDG is the main player. It's been used for quite some time. Um, also, evaluation of amyloid deposits, evaluation of inflammation, um, evaluating dopaminergic pathways and um, tau deposits in different parts of the brain. Uh, these are the different aspects that I'm going to cover today. First, we start with FDG. This study was done uh, some time ago and uh, looked at the kinetics of uh, glucose or FDG and acute post-traumatic uh, changes. They evaluated 21 TBI patients uh, with cerebral contusion in acute phase about three days after the the event, uh, they uh, saw a reduced whole brain exokinase activity and include the uninjured cortex um, and also an impaired glucose transport in the area immediately around the contusion area. But a subgroup of seven patients showed increased FTG uptake in the pericontusional area and they concluded might must be, uh, must be due to regionally increased hexokinase activity. So we, they saw some changes in kinetics of the glucose. This study, in this study we performed a few years back, we looked at 12 veterans with pure blast induced and 12 with blunt um, brain trauma. They both and both groups had lower scores in neuropsychological assessments and standard health survey. However, the blast-induced TBI group demonstrated 
greater deficits in attentional control and regional brain metabolism in uh, the right superior parietal region. So there was some difference between the two groups. This is a more recent study. Um, looked at 33 blast exposed veterans with uh, uh, multiple traumatic brain injuries. On average, they had 21.2 um, TBIs in their lifetime. They found a statistically significant negative correlation between number of blast-related multi-TBIs and cerebellar metabolism. These two articles are good reviews uh, of FDG PET in mild traumatic brain injury and um, also in uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy for additional readings if you are interested. Now, another application of um, FDG PET or PET in general can be longitudinal studies. This was a study we did a few years back with a small cohort of two, um, two patients with um, mild traumatic brain injury received trigeminal nerve stimulation for six to eight weeks. And then we, we did a pre-treatment and post-treatment PET, which are shown in the image. And we, we both subjects reported a uh, cognitive improvements and um, improvement in FDG uptake in several areas of the frontal lobe. So again, this was just a limited study that showed uh, longitudinal evaluation of patients with traumatic brain injury. Now we're going to switch gear and um, review um, some other uh, radio tracers. We started with uh, amyloid imaging. Uh, this study was uh, done uh, using uh, Pittsburgh compound in 15 TBI patients uh, with 1 to 361 days after a TBI and 11 control subjects. And in some subjects who died, they used autoradiography and immunocytochemistry uh, for a comparison. So the TBI group demonstrated increased the beta amyloid in cortical gray matter and the striatum. Um, this other study looked at 28 patients, 9 TBI, 9 control, and 10 Alzheimer's. And it was 11 months to 17 years post moderate to severe TBI. Again, they used Pittsburgh compound B. Um, and they found uptake in TBI patient in the posterior cingulate and cerebellum. So the TBI in TBI, the distribution of amyloid overlapped with the Alzheimer's disease. Again, another study with uh, C11 PIP compound in TBI patients, 12 chronic TBI patients. Um, they had only three positive and no correlation between um, uptake and severity of symptoms. So they concluded the finding does not support beta amyloid deposit progress over time after TBI. In this other study, they did serial imaging. So that's an example of longitudinal PET evaluation of patients. Uh, they used uh, fluorbetopir. Uh, they compared the patients to normal controls. Uh, so there was an initial increase in for a better peer uptake um, in some areas of the brain, including caudate, hippocampus, and preconius, which decreased over time. So they concluded that 18 enflopetopir PET may be useful in monitoring amyloid dynamics after severe TBI and may be predictive of uh, cognitive deficits in some subjects. So all these studies 
they showed some findings, but they are all small cohorts and uh, for a short period of time. So more studies are needed for evaluation of amyloid. Now another exciting uh, uh, imaging radio tracer is uh, evaluation of thaw, and then this uh, radio tracer for evaluation of thaw in this study they looked at nine subjects four control three with history of tbi and two with mild cognitive impairment and in mci subjects there was increased uptake in occipital parietal and temporal cortices these are the two subjects on the right here um, while there was a different pattern in traumatic brain injury again small group this was a case report on a 39 year old retired football player with 22 concussions uh, and progressive neuropsychiatric symptoms. They did the AV1451 PET um, and it showed retention in gray white matter jun junction. And also SUV analysis showed increased uptake in uh, bilateral cingulate occipital and orbitofrontal cortices. However, the amyloid imaging was negative in this subject. So the authors concluded that topathy imaging may be a promising tool to detect and diagnose chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, so we, now we have one approved uh, tracer for imaging of topathy. Uh, hopefully there may be, there will be more studies uh, to evaluate uh, traumatic brain injury with this radio tracer. Another interesting uh, study looking into neuroinflammation. And they looked at nine former NFL players and nine age matched groups. Uh, they used a tracer which binds to the uh, TSP or translocator protein, a marker of brain injury and repair. And they, re they showed increased uptake in supramarginal gyrus and right amygdala with varied performance of memory and verbal learn. Uh, so this is again a small study, some interesting findings, but uh, needs additional uh, evaluation with larger groups and longitudinal studies. So we've been used 18F DOPA for Parkinson's Diagnosis for long time. This is an old study which looked into six patients with post traumatic Parkinsonism um, and 32 age match normal control and 18 patients with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So, F DOPA PET imaging uh, revealed 40% reduction of uptake in CODID and containment of uh, post traumatic Parkinson's patients compared to control. And the study concluded that. Um, 18F DOPA may help to differentiate PTP from idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So in conclusion, PET is a great research tool for evaluation of individuals with TBI. However, additional large-scale studies are needed to evaluate its clinical application. PET is useful for evaluating individual cases and can be helpful in longitudinal studies as well as treatment response evaluation. FDG is the most widely used tracer in evaluation of patients with TBI, however. New tracers have great potential to impact clinical application of PET. Now we're going to switch gear and briefly review brain death imaging. Brain death is defined as complete and irreversible cessation of entire brain activity, including the brain stem. The cardinal triad for diagnosis of brain death includes coma, absence of brain stem reflexes, and apnea. The diagnosis is mostly clinical, however, ancillary testing is recommended uh, American Academy of Neurology guidelines included uh, cerebral angiography, electroencephalography, 
transcranial Doppler ultrasonography and uh, cerebellar scintigraphy using HMPAO. So we're going to briefly this review the uh, HMPO imaging. So the isotope should be injected within 30 minutes after its reconstitution. Um, anterior and both lateral planar images um, acquired with 500,000 counts of uh, head. Um, so that several times several time points of imaging it's immediate after injection uh, 30 and 60 minutes between 30 and 60 minutes after injection and two hours after a correct iv injection may be confirmed with additional images of the liver demonstrating uptake in that area however it's optional um, so the positive scan is defined with no radionuclide localization in the middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery or basal artery territories, which is called a hollow skull phenomenon and no tracer in superior sagittal sinus, um, but sometimes you may see minimal tracer activity from the scalp. Uh, this is a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of a negative and a positive case. The negative case, there is activity in the brain. This is a photopenia due to a uh, hematoma. In the positive case, on the right side, there is no activity in the brain. This concludes our presentation today. Uh, thank you for attention.